I love the EMF crowd, and that's one of the reasons why. I actually got my best cheer ever at a presentation at EMF two years ago, because I got to come up on stage and announce that the toilets had been unblocked. <laughs> so, I like to call this slot the Oh Sod the Tent, let's get a beer and watch something slot. Um, so I hope you're all settled in, hope you're all having a good time. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Right, let me ruin that for you. Um, I'd like to tell you a bit about myself first, very quickly. A uh, hundred years ago, I used to write for this magazine uh, about this computer. Uh, these days, I can be found at the National Museum of Computing, uh, where I give talks on the world's first computer, Colossus. Now, the reason I put this talk together was I kept getting asked the same question again and again when I gave these talks, and that is, we had a great computer industry. What happened to it? It all got thrown away. We were brilliant in the 80s, and now we're nothing. And I always give the same answer. Nothing happened to our computer industry. You just don't know about it. Now, time for the history. We have to start by asking ourselves, what is a computer? Now, this is a much harder question than many people realize. It involves a lot of geeks getting around with a few pints of ale and doing some serious beard stroking while we try and work out just what is a computer? Now, I can tell you this much. These are computers. There's a lot of computers in this room, but it's not the machine. It's the people. Computer was a term like bookkeeper or accountant originally. They're using mechanical calculators to do all the calculations we do with computers today. They are the computers. Is this a computer? This is around 150, maybe more, BC, and it's called the Antikythera Mechanism. It was discovered in 1901, but it's only recently that they've realized that it was some kind of analog computer that may have predicted uh, lunar cycles or eclipses. Its true purpose is still not known. But if so, if that machine is rebuilt and works the way we think it is, that would definitely be the world's first analog computer. Now, in answering the question, what is a computer, someone came along and wrote down all the rules for us. And we'll come back to him in a bit. But I'm going to start in 1801. Jacquard produces punch cards for loom machines. These punch cards are a series of instructions that the machine can read and understand to produce different types of patterns as they weave. It is code. It is the first program. It might not be for a computer, but this is the first time you can instruct a machine to do different things. Babbage takes on that idea. Now, firstly, he's been working on the difference engine. The difference engine was meant to be a superb machine for doing calculations. Definitely not a computer, because it's, uh, it's linear in operation like a calculator is. But it never gets built. Although he tried in 1822, in 1831, disputes over the uh, elaborate machinery and the machining cost caused the project to fail. If you take a look at this close-up of the replica that's been built in the Science Museum, uh, it just wasn't possible to manufacture that kind of components at reasonable cost in those times. He abandons the project. But he does start designing a second machine called the analytical engine. Now, this never got built. Um, he was con constantly redesigning it up until his death. If it had have been built, this would have been, without a doubt, the world's first computer. It would have been what we call Turing Complete, and I'll get to that in a minute. It used those Jacquard punch cards to feed programs into the machine. The machine could branch and make decisions based on what its results were. This is the start of a prototype replica, which should be complete by 2021, and we'll find that out once and for all. Interestingly, Babbage was in constant uh, communication with Ada Lovelace. She was the daughter of mad, bad, and dangerous to know Lord Byram. She was a mathematical genius. And uh, she worked with Babbage on putting together the first algorithms that the analytical engine would have run. This is now accepted to be the world's first computer program. And this is our world's first computer programmer. Exactly. Hey, <laughs> we like that. So let's skip forward to 1936. Alan Turing. Alan Turing publishes a paper. And I hate this bit, right? Uncomputable numbers with an application to the Enschlundungs problem. If anyone speaks German here, I've just mangled that, haven't I? <laughs> yeah. It means decision problem. And it is this problem in computing about what makes a computer different from a calculator is that based on one result, it can go one way or the other with the next bit of code it runs, branching. Now, um, this, described, this paper described a machine called the Turing machine. 
Here's an attempt to create one. Now, Turing machines uh, demonstrated that you could solve any mathematical problem in the universe using ones and zeros. You just had to build a machine that could process them. This paper is um, accepted as founding computer science. It didn't invent the first computer, but it did start the branch of computer science. Um, the reason you can't build a Turing machine is to solve every mathematical problem, the tapes on the two sides of it have to be of infinite length. So uh, it's a force experiment. But what Turing did next is a lot more interesting. He went here. Anyone ever been to Bletchley Park? Oh, excellent. OK. Right. Um, I used to be a tour guide there, and I used to love showing off this machine. So I'm sure many of you are all familiar with this. Uh, Bletchley Park was the home of the code breakers during World War II, and it's principally most famous for breaking the Enigma machine, a German cipher machine so complicated it had 150 million, million different combinations. Turing is one of a team who successfully broke that machine on a regular basis. His idea was don't try and find what the settings are, try and find out what they are not and reduce the number. To do that, he designed with Gordon Welshman a machine called the bomb, with an E on the end, bomb. Uh, if any of you have seen the Im imitation game, this might look familiar, although they refer to it as Christopher in the film. It's actually called the bomb. And that took the process of breaking Enigma down from something that took weeks to around a few hours. But it's not a computer. This is an electromechanical device. It doesn't have any code that it runs as such. Another cipher machine that Bletchley Park were up against in uh, World War II was this one, the, the Lorenz SZ-42. Now, this was the machine used by Hitler and his high command. Much more powerful than Enigma, much harder to break. Well, that intrigued me. Um, <laughs> Now, it wasn't until the, uh, a German military operator made a huge mistake and uh, sent um, two messages using the same crypto key that Bletchley Park broke into it, and a man called John Tiltman broke it. Bill Tutt took that information away and created an algorithm that could break these Lorenz messages. Uh, and this, bearing in mind, without ever having seen the machine or having an ounce of technical data on it, they just reversed engineered it from the brakes. He was able to build an entirely working replica of the machine and also had this algorithm to break it. Tommy Flowers took that algorithm and had a bit of a breakthrough. He realized, just like Turing said, it was all to do with ones and zeros, and things that are great at ones and zeros, on and off, true and false, are valves. I don't know if you can see that. So, uh, Tommy Flowers, actually working for the post office, building uh, phone exchanges, went on and with his valves designed the Colossus Mark I. This is an almost Turing complete computer. Um, and it took the breaking of Lorenz down to six to eight weeks per message to around 40 minutes. 300 messages a day. It broke thousands of messages towards the end of World War II, including one that was a direct order from Hitler to his generals in Normandy to move to Calais and fortify it because he thought the Normandy uh, invasion was going to be a trick. That information set the day for D-Day. So successful was this machine, a second version was built. This is 2,500 valves. And you can go and see this one. This is a rebuild of one of the 10 Colossus that were built. And that's at the National Museum of Computing. Quick plug there. Um, and that's a wonderful thing to go and see. And if you're very lucky, I'll give you a talk on it. No. Right. Now, the problem was that when they went away after World War II, all of this was covered by the Secret Act. You couldn't breathe a word of it to anyone. And in fact, the existence of Colossus was not public knowledge until around 2001, when it, we knew there was a machine there, but we didn't know what it was for. And it wasn't until 2001 that secret was revealed. So, a lot of people say the world's first computer is actually American. So the Americans come and ruin it for us all. And they say, no, 1946, ENIAC, University of Pennsylvania. It's a monster, 17,500 valves, 5 million solder joints. And it was built particularly for military purposes. Uh, wasn't very successful, was not a reliable. It's more of a sort of ongoing development of machines. But actually, Colossus was there a few years earlier. But all the people who were working on the Colossus project, uh, Alan Turing was on the periphery, Max Newman, who headed up the project, uh, they all went off to universities, and suddenly, out of nowhere, these universities, post-World War II, got very good at building computers. But they couldn't say why. So you got suddenly a whole rash of computers coming out, like the uh, Manchester Baby or Manchester Mark I. Alan Turing designed the Pilot Ace, but uh, sadly, he, uh, he left before the project was, um, was completed, and uh, sadly died short, shortly afterwards. 
Now, another computer of note is EDSAC, the Electronic Delay Storage Automated Calculator, built by Remick and Wicks in Cambridge. Now, this, you can say, is the first reliable computer, the first useful general purpose computer. Um, and it uh, was the first computer to have RAM, because Colossus and all these ones before it had zero bytes of RAM. They couldn't store anything. They had a bizarre idea. They used mercury delay lines. These are tubes of mercury that you send ultrasonic waves down. The mercury slows the wave down, and then you've got a piece of information in stasis, and you have to loop it round and round and round. Very bizarre, but it worked. Now, this is all very high-tech stuff and very expensive to build. The university couldn't fund it, so how did they pay for it? Was it um, some scientists wanting to get the, an early start on the space race? Was it the military looking for the calculations to build a super bomb? Was it some evil geneticist trying to create some kind of monster? <laughs> oh, the political joke worked. Nice. <laughs> Who paid for it? Well, of course, this was Britain. And if you're going to solve a computer, uh, use a computer to solve a problem, you're going to need to do something about tea and cakes. Now, for any foreign visitors we have with us, firstly, welcome. Secondly, we need to impress on you how important this is to the British people. This is the Queen's 90th birthday celebrations. This is the most British photo I have ever seen. <laughs> they are happy for two reasons. Firstly, they're getting a cup of tea. Secondly, the gardens are cute to do it. It's fantastic. And it's raining, so we can all complain about the weather. Three reasons. So based on that, who paid for that computer to be built? Well, actually, it was Jay Lyons & Co., the tea shop. Now, this wasn't any ordinary tea shop. This was a Starbucks of its day. It was everywhere. Um, every high street had one. They had big restaurants in London. They invented the ready meal and used to sell them in the shops. They were a huge operation, and they were having a problem with bakery valuations. Here's the one of their five bakeries, get an idea of scale. Every day they had to have the fresh ingredients in the right amounts with least amount of waste to, you know, to save expense, to get all those cakes, they had to get the orders in and process them. It was a massive operation. And they had the foresight to think, these newfangled computer things could help us. They bankrolled EDSAC and then used the information they were given at the end to build the world's first ever computer for business purposes, the LEO, the Lions Electronic Office. This did the bakery evaluations, the daily orders from the shops, and the payroll. And that went live in 1951. That was so successful, they thought, hmm, maybe other people will want to buy them too. And they formed Leo Computers Limited. This is important. This British company was the first ever company solely designed for building computers, set up for that job. Other companies like IBM fell into it as they evolved. This was the first, what, ever, first ever commercial computer company. They built behemoths like the Leo Mark II. Did very well, had sales of 11. Um, now, thankfully, they were so expensive that made them a fortune. Slightly more successful, Leo Mark III, which had sold a massive 62. Um, and one of those was still in use by BT in 1981. I'm not joking. Um, they were revolutionary because they updated the um, storage to these things called core stores. These are, uh, they're sort of made up of a horizontal and vertical axes. Each crossover point has a little magnet in them. And by putting current down there, you can charge the magnet one way or the other. So there's your one and zero. Uh, and they were also uh, non-volatile, which meant when you took the power off, they carried on storing the memory. So that was the world's first SD card. And that is a whopping 1,024 bytes of memory. Right there, 1K. Now, there were other companies coming up at this time who had evolved into making computers. And they were English Electric, and they had just merged with Marconi, who you may have heard of. Um, and eventually, as things consolidated, as they always do, Leo joined them as well. So you've got this uh, three companies come together, this new powerhouse of British computing. What are we going to call them? Well, they called themselves English Electric Leo Marconi. <laughs> and kept the rather questionable logos. Another company came along at the same time called Elliott. They'd been making scientific instruments since the 1800s. But in 67, they joined the company as well. Um, they've been building things like the 405, the 803, and the 903. That's, again, that's our one National Museum of Computing, still fully running. Um, and then some other companies came along. Now, these companies didn't have bad logos. They just had names. And they weren't happy with that, so they wanted to merge and be a competitor to English Electric. Um, so they formed together and got themselves a nice, nasty logo, which is International Computers and Tabulators. 
But then the Americans turned up and ruined everything. They launched the PDP-8. Excuse my knees. Got, got a replica of one here. Admire the blinking lights. Um, and these were the first personal computer. They sold 50,000 of them. Um, because they were useful for smaller tasks. That's what mini computer means. Doesn't mean the size means the task. Um, and if you had a sort of reinforced steel desk, you could put it on your desk and use it as well. This caused a seismic shift in the industry. So the Labour government at the time, led by Wilson, uh, got Tony Benn to actually merge ICT and English Electric Leo McConey, take all their terrible logos and make one truly awful one. <laughs> which is International Computers Limited. Um, in 1968, another little company set up then as well. I'm not sure what happened to them. Um, <laughs> right. A short break. Thank you. I just want to be the first ever presentation to have an ad break in it. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm already running horribly behind, and they're going to start throwing things at me. Uh, 1973, Cl Clive Sinclair sets up Sinclair Research. He's been working along with smaller things like amplifiers, record players, that sort of thing. But he's convinced by his partner, Chris Curry, to start on a computer project. Chris Curry heads up the team that gives us the MK14. This was the Raspberry Pi of its day. An amazing price point of £39.99, about £260 now. Uh, but you've got a little computer. This is the time when computers filled rooms. This was unbelievable. Still a very nice product. But they thought they were going to have huge success with it. But the Americans turned up and ruined everything. <laughs> because they had the Commodore PET. Although it was very expensive, this was a one-plug deal. You plugged it in, switched it on, you were computing. 32K of rocket memory. Um, Chris Curry wants to fight back against this. Um, uh, Clive Sinclair isn't that interested. So Chris Curry decides to go it alone. So in 1978, Chris Curry leaves Sinclair. He tells Clive in the Baron of Beef pub over lunch. Clive proceeds to chase him round the pub with a rolled up newspaper. <laughs> and that's how a pub fight revolutionized the computer industry. And I'll tell you why in a minute. Because Chris goes off with Herman Hauser and forms Cambridge Processor Unit. Not the catchiest name, so they decide to trade under Acorn, so they go above Apple in the phone book. The, the eight bit wars of the 80s begin. The Sinclair ZX80 is already out. They react with the Acorn Atom, much more expensive but more powerful. One of my favorites, ZX81. Comes out, first sub 100 pound computer if you're handy with a soldering iron which I wasn't, as it turned out. Um, amazing, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, and um, that was uh, an amazing thing, but uh, at, the, at that time, the BBC, uh, British Broadcasting Corporation, wanted to have an educational computer, and they were gonna pay a lot of money for it. Sinclair and Acorn both went for it. I think we all, most of us know who won. It was Acorn with a masterpiece, the BBC Model B. But um, Sinclair sort of had the last laugh. This was an amazing computer. What really succeeded in the homes was his competitor, the ZX Spectrum. Yes, I've got one of those as well. <laughs> Wonderful computer. And uh, they tried to react because the, uh, the BBC was very, very expensive by comparison. So they came up with the Electron, which is a bit smaller. Didn't do that well, really. But the Americans were trying to ruin it all at the time. Uh, and many of you who fought in the 8-bit wars in the 80s will know about these fierce Sinclair-Commodore rivalry that took place at that time. I'll just give you my opinion on that. Uh, <laughs> there we go. But something else seismic happened as well. The birth of the video game industry. This was truly remarkable. All these kids up in bedrooms 
um, starting to code away, trying to learn the machine code. Suddenly they were driving Ferraris around. There was this massive explosion. Some of these companies still exist of us today. And um, suddenly you had all these millionaires and this new industry was born in the UK. But what about the business sector? What was going on there? Well, the Americans ruined it all. Because in 1981, they invented this. The IBM PC came out, and it totally dominated the business industry from there on in. Because our industry at the time was building behemoths like this, the 2966. This is a small one. It used to run McAlpine's uh, payroll. And um, there's one believes to still be running in um, Russia that is four floors high. But why have one of these when you could have one of those? Another little thing happened around the early 80s as well. A new chip was designed by Acorn, and uh, it was called the ARM1, and it was designed for the Archimedes machines. Bear that in mind, we'll come back to it. Also in 1985, we did have a decent good stab back at the PC with this remarkable little device. Uh, Alan Sinclair introduced the PCW, 199 pounds, you've got your monitor, your software, your keyboard, and your printer, a complete all-to-go business machine. It sold 8 million units, the biggest selling UK computer of all time. However, consolidation happens and things go wrong and the industry actually started to collapse in 86. Acorn was purchased by Olivetti and Sir Clive Sinclair sold his business to Alan Sugar. And what did we do during the 90s? That. Horrible little beige boxes. That was the computer industry in the 90s. So much so that in 1990, ICL was sold by uh, to Fujitsu, who still own the intellectual rights to the, this day. And the actual brand was discontinued in 2002. Gone forever. Also, Acorn was split into two companies. One was called Element 14, which dealt with broadband. And the other was Arm continuing the beautiful tradition of really dull and terrible British computer logos. <laughs> Arm was a venture between uh, what was left of Acorn and um, Apple and VLSI. And it was to design and make chips for this, the original iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't go so well, that machine. Um, the idea was that Arm would only design the chips, they would not manufacture them. So it was an intellectual property. They sort of went along in the background, doing quite well for themselves, growing steadily, but in 2007, they exploded. Every iPhone ever made has an ARM-designed processor in it. They may call it the Apple A5 or the A7 or whatever. It's an ARM processor, and it was designed in Cambridge. And just to show this is, not a this is a bipartisan presentation, there's a lot in these ones as well. Oh, our Android friends have uh, lots of... Uh, these wonderful ARM processors in them. In fact, 14 billion ARM design processors were manufactured around the world last year. And on that point, I was going to wrap this presentation up. I was going to think, you know, makes you proud to be British, that doesn't it? Our wonderful, wonderful ARM and the computer industry. <laughs> Arse. <laughs> it hasn't happened yet. SoftBank have offered a heck of a lot of money. Herbert Hauser is still involved with the company, doesn't want to sell. Um, and they've said they will keep on Cambridge, they will double the employees, but as I've sort of demonstrated with this talk, that doesn't always happen. So what are we left with? Well, actually, it's not all bad news. Imagination, ever heard of them? Only, a, yeah, not that many, uh, but uh, you will find their design processes in every iPhone as well. They design GPUs. They're based in Kings Langley, just outside Hemel Hempstead. Apple are currently looking into acquiring them for billions. British company. And of course, we've got our wonderful video games industry. The video games industry is now bigger than Hollywood. And a lot of it is in the UK. Let's look at some of those names there. So at the top, you've got Rockstar, Grand Theft Auto series, say no more. They're based in the UK. You've got Frontier, David Braven's company. Originally back in the 80s, they did Elite. Now we have Elite Dangerous and the new theme park simulators coming out as well. Rare came from the ashes of Ultimate Play of the Game. They're now owned by Sony, but still based in the UK. Us two did Monument Valley, one of the most beautiful mobile games I've ever played. Team 17, uh, Lemmings, of course, and that series of games. And uh, Hello Games. Now, on Tuesday, Wednesday, depending on what you believe in the papers, they are going to publish No Man's Sky, which looked to be one of the most astounding sandbox games ever released. Uh, shrouded in secrecy about what it's actually all about, but um, it's all stuff that's coming out of the UK. 
And of course, it would be wrong for me to leave out these guys. David Braben and Evan Upton formed the Raspberry Pi Foundation to perform a new kind of computer. This is the MK14 of its day, back again. History is repeating itself. Um, this wonderful, cheap, 30-odd pound computer came out and completely took the industry by surprise. If that wasn't enough, they decided in 2016, this year, to make the Pi Zero. A computer so cheap and so small, they decided to give it away on the front of a magazine. And also, we must mention, of course, our friends, uh, BBC Microbit. Um, that's a wonderful little device, and that's been given to, uh, I think it's Keytage 2 children, uh, all free of charge, every child in the country who qualifies for it. And unlike the Model B, uh, the, B the original BBC, which is more about having your, having your screen and writing your code, this is about interacting with the world around you. Very appropriate for the sort of people we find here. So, let me li leave you with a final thought. This photo was taken in 1957. This is an Elliott computer being delivered to Norwich uh, Treasury to help with the budget calculations for the council. The day after the Pi Zero came out, someone went and took this photo. <laughs> the question we're all charge of, in charge of answering is, what's that photo going to look like in 60 years' time? Thanks, everyone. We've, we've probably got time for a couple of questions, um, if anyone's got any. Um, I've got one, actually. You, you nope. mentioned machines being Turing complete. Yes. Or partially Turing complete or yes. Turing complete. What does Turing complete actually mean? Yeah, I did want to get into more detail on that. Turing complete is a set of uh, definitions of what a computer must do. The one that gets argued about all the time is it must branch, um, which means it has to make a decision based on a result it's calculated. So people often say that Carl Zeus's machine, the Z3, which predated Colossus by a couple of years, is the first computer, but it could not branch, so we don't count it. Any other questions? Well, I was going to say, uh, I'm happy to take questions down here. Uh, I've also had some interest in people wanting to have a look at the uh, PDP-8 replica, so I'm going to be over in the robot arms, because I'm parched, um, and if anyone wants to come and have a play on it, you're more than welcome to do so. Yep, if you've got any questions, I'll be down there. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay, thank you very much, PJ Evans. Thank you.